Hello and welcome to our 62nd meeting for Sunday the 2nd of May 2021 uh, for the at, as it were, at the Lincoln Road Chapel, as near as we get at the chapel at the moment. I am so pleased to be able to welcome to our meeting Andy Ryder, who is the Stepney Dean of Mission. He was previously the rector at Christchurch Spitterfields, where our brother Cadwell used to run the Bengali group, both to evangelise and to encourage the faith of uh, Bengali people who had received the, the gospel. And also, there's another link, my own daughter Elizabeth was uh, there for about 10 months doing an internship at Christchurch, working with Andy and the folks there, 2017 into 2018. So I'm looking forward so much to what our brother has to say to us and indeed to the rest of the meeting. Let's ask the Lord to help us. If we ask him to help us, he will help us. That's just how he is. Let's pray. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, the one who died for our sins, who perfectly expressed your love, your wisdom, and your justice. Everything you want to say and do for us is in him. And he rose from the dead, justifying all that he did, ascended into heaven, into your presence. And he's here with us through the Holy Spirit that he sent. That's wonderful to us, our God. It encourages, encourages those of us who love and know you. And we pray that it would not only do us good, those of us who do love you, but this may be used, this meeting, and many like it up and down the land, be used by the Holy Spirit to bring the truth of Jesus to many. Lots of needs on our hearts, people in need in the chapel, people we know about internationally, your church in the nation. We commend them and ourselves to you now and give you thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Can I just say how welcome you all are uh, to join us today.
the children's spot. Well, during the last year, I've been having a sort out of some of the things that are in my loft, and you'd be surprised what I've found. One of the things that I've found are a lot of old children's toys. I'll show you a picture of some of them. Here's just a few of the toys I've found. You can see I don't throw things away. So you might recognise some of these. I can see a little engine there and I can see a lot of the Thai babies, cuddly toys, some plastic hammers, plastic food on plates, teddies, rocking horse books, Lego, building blocks. Oh, oh there's a little puzzle there. All sorts of things that I have kept. But of course, when I saw all these, I thought, oh, they would be good for the grandchildren when they come and play. So I'm still keeping them, except that now they're in the back of my living room rather than up in the loft. But that got me thinking, because I'd also heard something on the radio, I think it was, about toys. Now, let me show you the next picture. Now, these are toys which are marketed very well. So what I was hearing was the marketing companies every year try and bring out a toy at Christmas to create a new toy craze. Now, you might recognise some of these. Some of them are very old because they're toys that I can remember when my children were little. There's Tracy Island there from Thunderbirds and there's some Transformers, there's Furby, there's Pogs, which basically were just little circles. Uh, there's a Cabbage Batch doll, there's that Thai baby, uh, there's a Game Boy, and there's a Tamagotchi. Can you believe that people used to have Tamagotchis? But they wanted to create um, a demand for these toys, and so everybody would rush out, and their children would want one for Christmas, They'd even be fighting in the shops to try and get the latest craze for their child at Christmas. Well, that's all very well, but it's the toys that just will probably look a bit boring that actually last the longest. Because once this craze has gone, if you're like me, you put it in the loft, or you give it away or throw it away and you never play with it again. And next year you want a different toy, which is the different craze. So that's what the marketing companies want you to do. But the best toys are toys like this. You can see building blocks. The building blocks, they carry on and on and on. So they may have changed, they've updated, they get a bit more whizzy, but basically they're the same and every child will just play with them. And as it says in the adverts, the only limit is your imagination. So you can build them. They're not phases, they're not crazies that you have to have at Christmas. They're just something that you keep on playing with day after day. So, of course, I've got all these toys now in my living room and that got me thinking again. It got me thinking of a story in the Bible. You can read it in Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 47. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came and the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation.
the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So in that Bible story that we've just heard, it's telling us how we need firm foundations. Obviously not firm foundations for a building, but firm foundations for our lives. And the first verse we read, Luke chapter 6, verse 47, tells us how to get those firm foundations. It says we need to come to Jesus, we need to hear his words, and then we need to put them into practice. And we should be doing this because Jesus always wants what's best for us and what's best for our lives. So they've been written in the Bible so that we know what's the best way for us to live. And we can build our lives on the Bible, on the truths that we read within the Bible. So the more we pray to God and the more we read the stories in the Bible, then our foundations will become stronger and we will be like that house that was built upon solid rock and it will stand firm through life because we know our lives are built on the truth of the gospel. Now the last verse that we read there also tells us what happens when we don't build on strong foundations. It says we're hearing his words but we're not putting them into practice so we're not actually taking any notice of them and then we would be like that building that was built on the sand that when the troubles come just like the rains and the floods in the story that may be things going wrong in our lives it may be our health that gets uh, we get sick or it may be something happens to the loved ones around us or it may be just little difficulties day by day but if we don't have a strong foundation to build on then slowly our lives might start to collapse because we're not sure of what we believe in we're not sure of the truth that we're trying to base our lives on and our lives don't make sense without Jesus so remember these words, remember this little story that Jesus told us, because it's because God really wants what's best for our lives. Thank you for listening. Emmanuel, everyone, I just want to say a few words regarding Christ Church Springfield and Bengali Christian ministry. Christ Church is surrounded by Bangladeshi people in Tower Hamlet. And the church was a great support for Bengali Christian ministry in that area. Where I met a great man of God, Reverend Andy Ryder, Sister Abba Bosch and many more. They allow us to use their premises long, long time for our fellowship. We are meeting once a month sometimes more than once a month, every Wednesday for Bible study for new believers, one-to-one -one meeting in a quiet place, and always Reverend Andy Ryder was opening the door for us. Christ Church helped us in a various way. They were supporting financially, they are supporting spiritually. Reverend Andy Ryder, who built a wonderful team to pray for us, to guide us, to meet us every month for meeting, to support us. And also this team built a wonderful bridge with Lincoln Road Chapel to help this ministry together. Together with Reverend Andy Ryder, we have baptized many people in Christ Church. What a wonderful joy I had that time. I just simply want to 
express my gratitude and gratefulness. Every time with this team and Christ Church and Lincoln Road Chapel, I felt that I had a wonderful spiritual umbrella where I was under the guidance. I had a wonderful support to evangelize through the Bengali Christian ministry and I felt that somebody, someone, a team who is praying for me. And Christ Church was always a tremendous support for us. I just simply want to say thank you so much, everyone, and may God bless you. Amen. Good morning, Lincoln Road Chapel. It's great to be with you again. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a privilege to speak uh, to the congregation today. Sorry I can't be with you in person. I hope this uh, recording will suffice. Well, we're going to be reading today from Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Let me uh, read that for you. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, the queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near to it. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading the passage of scripture from Isaiah that says these words. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and that eun and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit took Philip away, and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotos and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let me pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, that you give us the opportunity to dwell in your word and to hear your voice. May the words of my mouth this morning and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be here, as I say. Uh, Paul mentioned earlier that I am the Dean of Mission. That means that my job with some 60 churches across East London is to help them step into, to, or to explore first, and to step in to greater degrees of life and health and growth and mission. Well, when you get a passage like Acts chapter 8, it's a peach, because it's the story of one man's conversion to Christianity. And if mission is about anything, it's about people becoming believers. I have loved this passage for many years. I've used it to prepare loads of people for their baptism. The Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, like everyone who gets baptised, goes through three key steps as they prepare for the big day. He comes to understand who Jesus is. He comes to understand what Jesus has done. And he realises the free gift of love and life and God's presence that is available to him if he turns his life towards Jesus. Then he says, yes, yes, I will follow Jesus and serve him all my days. It is a baptism course on a page. But before we look at Acts 8, I want to take you back to Easter. Not the roast lamb and the Christmas pudding and the chocolate eggs. Yep, yep, I always have Christmas pudding on Easter day along with the roast lamb. It seems somehow theologically correct to do so. No, I want to take you back to the first Easter story as told by John in his gospel. In particular, I want to take you to John 20, 20 to 22. On the evening of that first day of the week, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus spoke, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What John tells us in these three amazing verses is what people who meet the reason Jesus are really like. Verse 20 they are overjoyed. So they are full of joy. 21, they are sent to change the world. They are full of purpose. And verse 22, they are given Jesus' spirit. They are full of the Holy Spirit. And this is God's gift to us too, as we encounter the risen Jesus, that we might be full of joy, purpose and the Holy Spirit. In fact, the rest of the New Testament, literally from John 21 onwards, reveals to us what life is like when Jesus' followers and his friends are full of joy, purpose and the Holy Spirit. This is what it's like. Fishermen become preachers and soldiers become missionaries. Women lead churches, young people lead churches. The church grows, people put their faith in Jesus. Jesus' followers are led to meet with high-ranking government officials and they choose to put their life in Jesus' hands. From the 15 to 20 people who met Jesus on the evening of the day that he rose from the tomb, holy joy, 
holy purpose and the Holy Spirit have spread all the way around the world so that today some two billion people claim to follow Jesus. That is phenomenal. 15 to 20 people, 2 billion people. Something has happened between there and there. And it's all to do with joy and purpose and the Holy Spirit. So let us come to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 is just one of millions of stories of what happens when a friend tells a friend about Jesus. When a friend and a follower of Jesus, living the strange yet beautiful resurrection life, goes through life led by God. It's all about Philip, to some extent, this story, isn't it? Well, Philip was not a star amongst the disciples. He was okay, but he was nothing special. The day of the miraculous picnic, he's the one asking, where should we go to buy all the bread? He was practical, but not very faithful. At the Passover feast, a crowd of Greeks ask him if they can see Jesus, and he anxiously pushes them over to Andrew. So to find Philip in Acts chapter 8 as a model of personal evangelism, it is so encouraging because if Philip can do it, then you and I can do it. The key, as you might not be surprised to hear, is that Philip is full of joy, full of purpose, full of the Holy Spirit. Earlier in the same chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 5, we read this. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and talked about Jesus. When the crowds heard him and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he was saying. Many were healed and lots were released from their past history. And there was great joy in the city. You see, joy is infectious. It, not, not some superficial happiness, but deep down joy, which bubbles up from a sense of faithful assurance. All is well between me and my maker. In fact, living in the light of the resurrection is itself infectious. In this Acts 8 story, we see God using Philip to change a person's life forever. So how does it work? What is the trick? What is it that Philip does that you and I could do that could change other people's lives? Well, what we get is a mini course in personal evangelism. So lift them up. And there are four steps. I know, I know preachers love three steps, but this one has four. These are what they are. Number one, double listening. Number two, talk to strangers. Number three, talk about Jesus. Number four, invite a decision. Let's look at them one at a time. Number one, double listening. Now, this was a phrase that was coined by John Stott, who we recently uh, marked a centenary uh, from his birth. Uh, he was talking about listening to God's word and listening to culture. But I'm sort of stealing the phrase and using it slightly differently. I'm talking about listening to the world and listening to God. You see, Philip was on the road that runs 50 miles southwest from Jerusalem to the coastal port of Gaza. Presumably, the Ethiopian planned to sail back to Africa. Philip is aware of others on the road. He's clocked the tall African government official in his chariot reading. But Philip is also listening to the murmurings of the Holy Spirit. And here's a divine nudge to approach the chariot. It's as if an angel whispered in his ear, go and speak with that man. Actually, I've got a friend uh, whom, whom this happens to quite regularly. Uh, he, he'll be standing at a bus stop and he will hear the Holy Spirit nudge him to go and talk to somebody in the queue. He's, it's great. I love his stories. In fact, I've always used to say to our church welcome team and our prayer ministry team, have your spiritual antennae up. Be listening to what God is saying to you. Listen to who he's taking you to. Some people are great, aren't they, at hearing God. They've got prophetic words and utterances, but they seem completely out of the touch with the world around about them. Other folks are really earthy and practical, just as Philip had been. And, and it's as if they haven't yet learnt to hear God's voice. God needs people who are in the world, but not of the world who clock what's going on, but listen to the Spirit. 
God wants people who are double listeners. Number two, talk to strangers. Oh my word, this is so easy if you are an extrovert. Your challenge is the next step that we're going to come to in a few moments. To use the conversation for God's purpose and not for idle gossip. But for those of you who fear the chat in the barber's chair or the wait for a delayed bus, those of you even secretly pleased that there is no coffee after church just at the moment, I'm sorry, but Jesus would love you to start saying hello to folks more often. I, I, I like chatting to people. I love it. Getting to know my new neighbours. I've just moved house. is fun. Meeting folk in my new church is great. My wife, Carol, she's not quite as keen on it as I am. But if we are to love our neighbour, as Jesus says, I have a hunch it starts by saying hello and opening ourselves up to the vulnerability and foolishness that might follow. And why do we do that? We do it for Jesus. Philip, this average, this mediocre disciple who lacked the confidence of his friends, having received the Holy Spirit, overcomes his shyness, heeds the divine nudge and runs alongside the Ethiopian's chariot. Now, the Bible doesn't record for us what I imagine were the first words, and I think they went like this. Wow, great wheels. Where are you headed? Uh, I'm going to Gaza. The road stops there and there's nothing else in this desert. There's nothing between here and there. Are you OK? You training for the Jerusalem Marathon? You look very exhausted. Yeah, I'm OK. I'm OK. <laughs> I saw you and wondered what you were reading. Sounds like you're reading from our prophet Isaiah. Stop the chariot. Stop the chariot. Get this man a glass of water. I am reading Isaiah and I've absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Step three, talk about Jesus. That's what Philip does. He gets into the chariot, he talks about Jesus. Okay, so these days there aren't many people traveling around reading out loud from the Bible looking confused. But if they did, are we ready and willing to help them understand who Jesus is? One of the biggest problems we have today with the lack of church growth is the fear of church members. Church members are scared. Some are scared of being found out even to be a Christian. Others, it's the fear of being asked to explain our faith. And for many of us, it's the fear of looking or sounding silly when we try to do it. But God knew centuries ago that this would happen. It's why he got Paul to write to the Corinthians that we should become fools for Christ. At the same time, assuring us that our foolishness pleases him, but the world's version of wisdom looks completely nuts to God. Here's the thing. Jesus also knows how hard it is for us. It's why he said to his friends and his followers in Luke chapter 12, when you are in a tight spot, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. In fact, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say before you're in a tight spot, through your Bible readings and your daily devotions. And when you are there in the tight spot, do the double listening, listening out for the Spirit of God, teaching and talking into your heart at the same time as clocking what's going on around you. Keep the spiritual antennae up. The Holy Spirit will not desert you. That is a great promise that Jesus gives us. In fact, the Holy Spirit is probably already at work in the other person, in drawing them into your, your life, into your path. Well, Philip does steps one to three. He double listens, he chats to strangers, he explains that Jesus is the answer. And then, the Ethiopian catching Philip's joy, seeing for the first time that Jesus is real, realising what Jesus has done for him, says to him, what, what do I do next? A actually, uh, the Ethiopian asks Philip if he can be baptised. Philip is straight in there, helping him give his life to Jesus. Step four is invite a decision. Invite a decision. We, we possibly all of us have had conversations with people about our faith, about our, our, our church life, about our relationship with Jesus. But how many times have we said to somebody, do you want to follow Jesus? 
Do you want to know more about Jesus? Do you want to come to church? Do you want to go on the Alpha course? I don't know, but I've got a funny feeling it's not as much as God would like us to say it. I remember uh, this guy called Nigel. Nigel is the guy who led me to faith. It was the 1970s. There was a, well, it was the end of the 70s, actually. Uh, there was a bad, mm, it was the 80s. It was the early 80s. But there'd been a song at the end of the 70s by a band called XTC called We're Making Plans for Nigel. And it could have been written for my mate, Nigel. Because in my eyes, Nigel was a complete and utter wimp. What's than that? He was a Christian wimp. But in God's eyes, he was a spiritual wimp giant. Nigel told me his church one day was praying for him. Uh, we were in a gravel car park and I got into my mini, I slammed the door, I spun the wheels, gravel flew and I drove out of that car park indignant that they should be praying for me. I wasn't indignant. As it turned out, I was overcome. I had to stop a couple of miles down the road and wipe the tears from my eyes. Nigel gave me a book to read about Jesus. Nigel told me about his relationship with Jesus. And one day, Nigel asked me if I wanted to follow Jesus. And a few months later, I said yes. And I've never looked back. Like the Ethiopian and all those who get baptised, I went through those three key stages. First, I had to understand who Jesus was. Second, I needed to know what Jesus had done for me. And thirdly, I came to realise the free gift of God's love, his life and his presence. And I said yes to following and serving Jesus. We must, every single one of us, we must invite others to make that same decision. Or we are depriving them of the greatest relationship available to them. The life-changing relationship with the same Jesus who stood amongst his friends 12 hours after rising from the dead and said, peace be with you. I am sending you to change the world. Here, be filled with my spirit. You know, as we come towards the end of this little talk, I'm reminded of Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 10, where he says these incredible words that are probably known to all of us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is perhaps the biggest promise in the whole of history. He goes on though, doesn't he? How can they call on him if they've not been believed? No, let me say that again. How can they call on him who they have not believed in? And then he goes on. How can they believe in him unless they hear about him? And then he goes on. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can anyone tell of Jesus unless they are sent? And then he goes on again. As it is written, we have all been sent. And how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We are a people not just of joy and the Holy Spirit. We are a people also of purpose. For we have been sent. We have been sent to change the world to change lives and to see others rejoicing. I love the fact at the end of our passage in, in, in Acts chapter 8, where it says that the eunuch never saw Philip again, but went on his way rejoicing. He was full of joy. He was full of purpose. He was full of the Holy Spirit. How beautiful are they who are full of joy, purpose and the Holy Spirit, who hear God's voice and chat to strangers. Just think what God might do through you. I'd love to pray for you before we finish. Heavenly Father, I pray for anybody listening to this talk who does not yet know you, that they would have uh, the opportunity in the very, very near future to say to somebody, who is this Jesus? What has he done for me? What does he offer me? And I pray, Father, for anybody listening to this talk who does know you, that we would remember again that the night that Jesus had risen from the dead, he sent his disciples with a purpose to change the world, to change lives one by one by one. And as they went, they were full of joy and full of the Holy Spirit. May we be Easter people this day and for always. Amen. Amen. 
Before I go, I probably should just mention that in the Anglican Church, we are still celebrating Easter. It lasts from Easter Sunday all the way through to Ascension. I don't know whether you do that in the Free Church, but I guess that's the shape of the year. So this year, why not do it with me? Be an Easter person. Go and change the world. Thanks so much for listening. God bless. I'm so pleased that our brother Andy was able to share that message with us. It's for Christians and for people who are not yet Christians. If you are a Christian, have a go. Note those four points that he made. Re, re, re-listen to, re-watch the video. It will be well worth it. We sang the song, or the song was sung, and I, maybe you joined in. It's talking to the Lord, you alone can rescue. yes. But he uses, he, he uses Christians. He, he works through us. That's the ordained method, just as he worked through Philip. And if you have never received Christ, you're more in the position of the Ethiopian eunuch. Some ways you may be entirely different to him, but in this respect, you haven't received Christ. You can do it. You may ask him. Directly, yes, as Andy said, speak to somebody, yes, but speak to him. Lord Jesus, save me. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. Please save me. Let's pray together. Again, our gracious God, we ask you to speak to us, to encourage, challenge, help us in whatever way you saw fit. You, you just do it. You never fail, and we thank you. Grant that each one of us may respond 
to what we've heard from you in the way that's appropriate. Bless Andy and his ministry, guide him, uh, guide all of us. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit remain with all of us who have received the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.